afternoon, um, good evening, um, good morning maybe to some of you um, in this new Zoom reality. Uh, again, my name is Roberto Gonzalez and I'm a professor of education um, at Harvard and I'm thrilled to, uh, to be leading off this uh, really, really star-studded uh, event um, in celebration of this, this wonderful uh, new book. Um, so I have the honor of introducing the two fabulous co-authors um, and because we've got an hour, I'm going to keep this um, relatively short. Um, but uh, Gilberto uh, Conchas is the Wayne K. and Anita Woolfork Oi Professor in the College of Education at the Penn State University. Um, he received his B PhD um, from the University of Michigan and his BA uh, from the University of California, Berkeley, both in sociology. Uh, Professor Conscious of Research unearthed, unearthed the triumphs in the, of urban youth of color despite une, unequal school community processes. Um, he's the author and, and co author of nine books. Um, that's right, nine books, uh, including The Color of Success, Street Smart, School Smart, Cracks in the Schoolyard, Educational Policy Goes to School, The Complex Web of Inequality. Um, and and the, the book that we're discussing today, the Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex uh, Dream, um, and numerous other articles, book, book chapters, and policy reports. Um, Dr. Conscious has been a professor at the, here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, so it's great to have him back. Um, also at the University of California at Irvine, and he's been a visiting professor at the University of Southern California, at San Francisco State University, at the University of Washington, University of Barcelona, and the University of California in Berkeley, and at Santa Barbara. Um, his co-author, Nancy Acevedo, is um, Associate Professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Technology at Cal State University San Bernardino. Uh, Professor Acevedo uses critical race and Chicana feminist theories to examine transitions along the higher education pipeline for Latina, Latino, Latinx, students with a focus on college access, choice, and transitions. Um, she was a UC Accord dissertation fellow and a faculty fellow for the American Association uh, for Hispanics in Higher Education. Um, her research has received numerous awards and recognitions, um, including the 2019 American Educational Research Association's Latin, Latina, Lat, Latino, Latinx Research Issues Emerging Scholar Award. Um, this is fantastic. Um, I'm thrilled and honored, and I will turn it over to, uh, to, to Gil. Thank you, Roberto. Really appreciate that. Uh, despite all of the uncertainty, uncertainties we're currently facing in the US and throughout the world, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for being here virtually with us. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to discuss our book and the experiences of first-generation college students of Mexican descent. Uh, we greatly appreciate the Harvard Graduate School of Education for hosting this event and for Professor Roberto Gonzalez for his generous introduction. And thank you to our distinguished panelists for agreeing uh, to participate. Laura Rendon, Professor Emerita at the University of Texas San Antonio, Leo Chavez, Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at the University of California, Irvine. Gina Garcia, Associate Professor of Education at the University of Pittsburgh. And Danny Solorzano, Professor of Education at the University of California, Los Angeles. Welcome to all. I would be remiss if uh, Nancy and I did not express our deep gratitude to our Harvard Education Press editor, Jane Farginoli who shared our passion for Chicana feminist theory and, tra and, and traveled this book journey with us. Muchas gracias, Jane. We truly appreciate it. We're indebted to many uh, in, in the writing of this book. Our profound gratitude goes to all the young men and women who through interviews and testimonials shared their intimate struggles, successes, and the human spirit. This book is for you, about you, and your journeys in the educational borderlands will inform future generations to come. This book is also about us. Nancy and I are both first-generation college graduates, proud first-generation PhDs, 
and proud first-generation tenured college professors. We began our intellectual journey at UC Berkeley, go Bears, uh, as first-generation undergrads, where we discovered our passion for Chicana feminism and critical ethnic studies. It is through these initial experiences that focus our own Nepantla critical consciousness that we hope to impact the research field, students, and our communities. I will now ask each of our panelists to give your general take on the book and to perhaps contribute to the discussion on how your own work relates to our book's central arguments. Nancy will then provide concluding remarks and we will end the session with a short question and answer period. We be will begin with Dr. Rendon. Adelante y gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Gil. And uh, it's such a, a pleasure to join all of you uh, today with the release of this uh, Fantastic piece of work, the Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx Dream, Hope, Resistance, and Educational Success. Um, I was uh, honored to write a short blurb for the book, uh, which appears in the back cover. Uh, and as I thought about it, as I, as I read the book this summer, um, I uh, added this statement uh, to the narrative that appears uh, in the back of the book. This is by far the most contemporary justice-based portrait of the Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx college experience. And I really mean that it's an extraordinary piece of research and exceptionally well-written, a, a phenomenal contribution to uh, the Latinx community in general. Some of the things that I really appreciated about the book um, include that it is centered with a Chicana, Chicano, Chicana lens. It's a gift, I believe. The book is a gift. It's up by and for our community. And it begins with the author's testimonials, you know, their own stories, Gil and Nancy's stories, very touching to read about um, how they grew up, uh, the children of Mexican immigrant farm workers and their extraordinary journey to become tenured university professors. They themselves are models of resistance and success. They themselves are atravesados. And I would venture to say that pretty much not everybody on this panel is an atravesado and also atravieso and everything good that comes with all of that. Uh, I also appreciated that they did not employ the experience of white students as the foundation to understand how students succeed. Um, no, they did not do that. They, in, they turned that around and they actually employed the Chicano, Chicano, Chicano student voices and experiences to really serve as a foundation using their voice and their experiences to come up with how indeed they succeeded, their own definition of success. And then as I thought about the book, and some of you may know my work, Senti Pensante, Sense, Sensing Thinking Pedagogy, I want to say boldly that I believe that this, is, this book employs a senti pensante research approach. It's as much about the heart as it is about the intellect. And throughout the book, it, we learn about systemic oppression that has really gotten in the way of educational achievement for students. And so I believe that this book certainly lifts, not trails, the scholarship on student success. And one of the key points that, that is made is that at every point in the educational pathway, students are confronted with many, many barriers. And you know, it, it could be that these barriers would totally preclude their success, but they moved on, they, they, they persisted. Uh, some of those barriers include segregated schools, the fact that you know, the schools in non-white school districts they get $23 billion less than white districts. The fact that they're still attending segregated schools and segregated higher education. Uh, all of those things um, really get in the way of student success. The fact that there are tremendous wealth disparities. Um, you know, students who grow up like, like me, for example, growing up in South Texas, our families, they, they don't have the assets, they don't have the money to transfer to us. I mean, they, 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 we don't have those sorts of privileges. Um, and then we also don't have the privilege that, that many whites have 
Kendi explains that to be white typically means being afforded the assumption of intelligence, even when not merited, policymaking power, housing in affluent neighborhoods, and resource rich schooling. This is a picture of Gloria Nasaldua. And um, I just want to say a little bit about her because, um, you know, Gil and Nancy do a beautiful job of incorporating her work in this book. Um, Gloria uh, is, a, is a Tejana. Um, I, I visited her gravesite in Hargill, Texas, a little ranchito. You, would, you wouldn't even know it exists. I mean, you can drive by in the freeway and miss it. You have to turn, get on a road about a couple of miles down, and all of a sudden there's this little tiny town. And the fact that someone like Gloria could come out of there and become this iconic theorist is an extraordinary story in and of itself. And I asked a dear friend of her, what would Gloria think? What would she say when she saw this book? And she said she would be very touched. She would be very happy to see her work incorporated in the educational arena. The authors also use testimonials, uh, which come out of a phenomenal book, Telling to Live. And uh, it's a tool to acknowledge the voices and experiences of those that have been historically marginalized. And so I really appreciate it also that the book employs queer Chicana feminist theory to frame the story. And so we hear words that typically we don't hear in the world of education research, borderlands, la frontera, atravesadas, atravesados, transgressives, la facultad, able to see beneath the surface, nepantla, nepantlera, or nepantlero, you know, these people traveling in these liminal in-between spaces and in, in our ability to, to navigate ourselves in all of these in-between spaces, often with little to no support. And so we learn who the atravesadas and atravesados are. And, and you know, did, I thought about my own experience uh, growing up in, in marginalized communities and uh, you know, attending uh, under-resourced schools, being viewed as less than uh, products of, of poverty and segregation, uh, unequal schooling, not given a fair chance. And yet, and yet, these students are also survivors. They're resistors. They, they figured things out as they navigated through you know, multiple um, worlds. They were hopeful for the future. They developed La Facultad, a form of critical consciousness, and they were able to achieve success. The book also highlights, and I really was happy to see this because of my own work in terms of validation theory, the importance of relationships, uh, which over and over again in the literature are, are pointed out as being critical to success, even critical to healing. Uh, so I call those validating experiences. These students did not succeed alone. They had a collective web of support around them and they took advantage of, of that collective web of support. They encountered these validating agents in and out of class. And, and these agents were the ones that, you know, you, you can do this, you know, you'll stay with it, you know, just, you know, encourage, support it, provided cariño and support. And so we learned, for example, from Javier, a community college student who was formerly incarcerated and pursuing welding that, you know, his, his uncle who was a plumber and his cousins motivated him to get a college degree. They were the ones who made Javier feel, I can do this. We hear from Yesenia, the daughter of Mexican immigrant parents. Uh, she struggled with a hypothyroid condition, became a community college biology major, and her validation came from teachers, classmates. And they inspired her to, to attend college. We hear from Miguel, a four-year college student at UC, majoring in history and biology, uh, very poor, undocumented immigrant parents. His validation, believe it or not, came from a gang leader uh, who saw his academic potential and told him he had a bright future. He actually barred the gang from initiating him. And his mother also supported him. And we hear from Cristina, a first-gen queer Chicana, Mexican heritage, learned to be an adult at age seven when her mother became very ill. She had to take care of her brother. 
and her validation came from her mother. Her mother didn't want her to grow up like her, you know, where she dropped out of high school and had children at an early age. She said, no, you need to get an education. And of course, caring teachers also provided food and emotional support. And she also turned to role models, such as Clinton and Obama. And she also talked about the UC Early Academic Outreach Program staff and participants that put her on the path to higher education. And so students then create their own definition of success through la facultad, through resistance, through their navigational ability, to their sense of giving back. And I've seen this in my own research that these students want to earn degrees, not just to have a certificate to hang on the wall. I mean, that's nice. They wanna use their education to put something back into their community, to be role models for those that are coming behind them, to make this place a better place to live. And so the book is hopeful uh, for realizing a dream that I think for too long has been deferred. It's about healing la, what Lorena Saldua calls la herida abierta in society and in K-16 education healing the wounds of racism, of exclusion, of homophobia, of invalidation. It's hopeful in terms of noting that students have la facultad. Uh, hopeful in terms of noting the critical role of educational institutions in providing the conditions and the resources for students to learn. Hopeful in the sense that the students have the power and we have the power to access the shadow beast, our shadow beast, that our agency comes from resisting, from opposing, and from challenging deficit normative structures of power. And so I end with a quote by Gordana Saldua about the shadow beast. She says, there's a rebel in me, the shadow beast. It is a part of me that refuses to take orders from outside authorities. It refuses to take orders from my conscious will. It threatens the sovereignty of my rulership. The Chicana, Chicano, Chicano's dream is about hope. It's about resistance. It's about really positioning students as the people who convey the truth about what it is to really find meaning and ultimate success in higher education. Thank you, Gil and Nancy, for this extraordinary piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Maybe you can be our agent. That was so <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, Leo? OK. Um, it, I still see someone else's screen up here, though. Maybe. Uh, uh, oh, OK, hold on. I need to stop sharing. Sorry. There we go. Great. Thank you very much. Um, well, I can echo a lot of what uh, was said there, which means I don't have to say a lot of it because it was very well put. And so I can just say, um, et cetera. I think that was, I want to say, first of all, thank you for letting me um, take a look at this book. Um, I wish I would have written a blurb on it. I would have said, must read. Anybody who's interested in this, in this why a people are able, particularly Latinos, Chicanos, to overcome obstacles, you have to read this book to see what's going on. Um, uh, I would send it widely uh, everywhere. Uh, I, uh, I thought it was great. It was really enjoyable to read. And so I thank you very much. I, there are a couple of points in there I think are really interesting and how they intersect with my own work. Um, but let me say, first of all, that it's incredibly well written. I just enjoyed reading it, number one. And, and probably because I, I really enjoyed the style of the writing. I think the use of Gloria Anseldua's framework, as we've heard, was a stroke of genius. And I think it just structured things so well and allowed you to give so many keen insights uh, it, was, it was a stroke of genius to use those, those kind of terms and those kind of like conceptions, I think, to frame the kind of uh, 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 things these students were telling you. It was, just, it was just great. I enjoyed reading it because of the testimonials. I mean, hearing people speak, hearing these students talk uh, in their own voice uh, goes way beyond most analyses that you can actually think of in a more abstract form because they were so, they were so clear, so articulate, and so... Uh, insightful themselves about how their lives were turning out that I just, I found it just a wonderful thing to read. I just couldn't put it down to you the truth. It was so great. Um, it, you know, the, the different concepts that Anseldua tosses out that you use, 
are all really incredible. I, I probably might maybe just focus more on the uh, atravesados because it, it correlates a lot with my own work, uh, mainly because the question I always, often ask is, you know, how do people become sort of in that situation? How do they how do they learn to perceive themselves as somewhat out of the system, as people who are, as Gloria Anseldua put it, who see themselves as not belonging, that somehow they're being told they don't deserve to be here. Um, that she, quote unquote, the prohibited and forbidden. Uh, it's what Roberto and I sort of talked about when we talked about abject status and, and, the, and the, the feeling of being abject, which means to be throw, your throwaways, you're discardable. You're like the taken for granted that no one really cares about, right? How do, how do you, so these atelisalos, how do they get in that position? And so I look at what I call the Latino threat narrative and that's the political rhetoric and society that frames Latino students and Latinos in general as being a threat to the society because they're a threat to our economic system, they're a threat to our demographic change, they're a threat to, um, uh, because they don't want to become Americans, uh, they're a threat because of women, Latinas, because of their reproductive capacity, uh, they have too many babies. I mean, there's so many parts of this. Donald Trump, the first day of his campaign for presidency, said that, you know, you know Mexicans are rapists and, and murderers, and, and maybe there's a couple of good people. This, this kind of rhetoric frames the kind of uh, perception these students are going into college with. When people think they're gonna fail, that they don't have something to contribute, that somehow they, they don't really belong to the education system, it's because it just didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of decades and decades and decades of a history of this kind of rhetoric about who, who they are. And I just found the book incredibly touching because what, you, what I found the testimonials to be was a sense that these students were unwilling to, to say, you know what, this rhetoric really frames me. This rhetoric really says who I am as a person. And this rhetoric really, in a sense, limits my capacity for growth. They said, no. Now, what, you, what I see here when I read this book is people struggling against these perceptions, against this uh, cage that society wants to put them into, and really, in a sense, finding ways to break it down and, and to succeed and learn to gain facultad about what it takes to break those cages, to break off the cuffs that are tying them down. And I just thought, you know, it's to have somebody like our president read this, to get another perception on how people are struggling to make it in our society, to get an education, to do well. And I, it, it's just wonderful. And what I really liked about it, not only were they in a sense uh, denying the society's view of them and the rhetoric to cast them in, in, a, in ways that are unchangeable, I like the way, as the articles and testimonials said, they, they contributed to the fact that this rhetoric doesn't recognize the contributions of their families, the struggles of their families, the struggles of Latinos and contributions they're making that the, this rhetoric just doesn't seem to recognize. And they drew strength from their perception of what the rhetoric missed, of what the rhetoric left out, of what the rhetoric was left unsaid about who they were as human beings, as Latinos and people in the society. They drew strength from that to resist. And that's what this book is about to me. And I just think it's just a wonderful book and one that should be read by anybody interested in, in how we can help these students who are struggling, you know, use our own facultad, which is what the book is really about, because here are two authors who use this in a way to make a difference, right? And how it's just, it's just a wonderful encouragement, I think, to anybody who reads it to say, you know what, these aren't people who are not supposed to be here. These aren't discardable people. These are people who deserve a chance, deserve to have a path, and deserve to be helped along that path by those of us who came before and had our own struggles. And that's why I really liked about the book. It's sort of this cycle. It's this cycle of, of learning, of obstacles, of penetration, of coming back, of taking back and forth. And so the book to me is a, it's a cycle of, of success that never would be achieved until that cycle starts going and people go back to get that cycle going again. I loved it. I recommend it highly to anybody who wants to read it. And that's my blurb. Read this book. <laughs> read this book, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you very much for letting me, letting me uh, participate. And I, and I really look forward to seeing you in person at some point in the future. Thank you, Leo. Those were very, very, very kind words. Um, uh, Dr. Garcia. 
All righty. It's hard to follow up those um, summaries. So I'm going to try not to do summary. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rendon, for giving us such a beautiful summary with PowerPoint and everything. I was like, oh, perfect um, <laughs> person to kick us off the conversation because it get a good, good overview. I'm going to go a different direction. I will also say I love the book. Um, I think one of the highest honors somebody can probably give is assign a book to their class, which I am doing. Um, and so so I hope y'all see that as like, yeah, um, in the spring, I am teaching a course um, first time here at the University of Pittsburgh on Latinx issues in education, contemporary issues, and we will read the book. Um, and so I'm excited for that. I'm excited to share it with my students. Um, and that's as soon as I read it, I was like, oh, I'm signing this. Like, I'm, we're reading this, right? I will definitely. Um, and so I will say that, that that is for sure. That's the level uh to which I, I have elevated the book of like, yes, it needs to be read um, by my students and by other students. Um, a couple things I will say um, in my blurb, I talked about the good, the way y'all combined theory and stories, testimonials together and in this beautiful way. And so if I wasn't going to assign the book in my Latinx uh, issues, contemporary issues in education course, I would assign it in my theories course, which I'm also teaching in the spring. And I'm like, since I have students taking both courses, I won't do that to them. But it's that powerful that it could, it could be in that course as well, um, because it's a beautiful display of how you use theory to guide work, um, to guide your thinking, to collect data, to be in conversation with students, um, to take their stories and elevate them in beautiful ways that tell this beautiful story and grounded in, in this theoretical idea of the borderlands. Um, I think a lot of people are, are, are familiar with Gloria Anzaldúa's work and, and, and vibe with it. I always say, if you don't, if Ansel Dua doesn't hit you in your soul. You might not have one. So I'm not sure, Leo, that the president would actually vibe with the book because I'm not sure he has a soul. Sorry, little jab there. But like, that's <laughs> how deep she is, right? Like her work is just that deep that it, I mean, and, and it's every student. I, I, I expose her work um, to a lot of my students who are non-Latino, Latinx identified, non-Chicano, Chicanx identified, who also vibe with, right? Like it it's just speaks to that borderlands, that space that many of us feel like we don't belong, particularly when it comes to identity and um, and not having to fit into like a, a one checkbox, right? Um, that many of us feel like we're lost in spaces um, oftentimes. So, so the way you bring her work in and, and elevate these stories in a beautiful way, it, it just aligns. Um, so I I would, I would, that would be the other course I would have my students read it in is, is a theories course to teach doctoral students how you take theory and, and use it in research in powerful ways, right? To uplift and elevate stories um, in beautiful ways. So those would be my, those are my first thoughts is like, what course am I going to teach this in? Uh, my students need, need to read this. So that, um, I wanted to make sure I touched on that. As far as, I like how we connecting it to our own work. So I wanna connect it to my own work because I was thinking about that as well. Um, I write about Hispanic serving institutions. I write about students once they arrive at institutions. I don't spend as much time thinking about how they actually got there. And so reading this book was a reminder of like the story to get to the institution. Um, and so as I connected and think about it, the the, the book highlights these, these stories of exactly the students that are enrolling in Hispanic serving institutions. Students who have completely fought through many barriers, many systems of oppression. I often say students who um, are in our institutions, Hispanic serving institutions are the most oppressed students in the educational system, right? Students of color, Latinx students, black students, Native American students, that's who's in HSIs and they have all struggled to get there not because they can't survive, but because the system of education has tried to beat it out of them at every, every turn, right? Nope, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. You're never going to do this. You're never going to go to college. You should join a gang instead. The gang will probably accept you more than higher ed, right? Like all of these ways in which education um, has told students of color that they are not worthy and they still make it 
right? Despite the fact that they fought through all these systems. When I freedom dream about what institutions of higher ed can and should be, those spaces, HSIs that are enrolling these students who have survived um, the borderlands, who have made it, the students that who y'all highlight, my, my mind goes to when are we gonna stop making students struggle? When will we set it up so that it, 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 it supports the students whose stories y'all tell these beautiful stories um, of, of, of really just surviving many different, different elements of, of being, of being racialized beings, of being immigrants, of being products of our environment, all these sort of things. Um, when are we going to just have educational spaces that empower and liberate and support students rather than constantly telling them they don't belong? Um, and I think we all know that as educators, as, as, as scholars of education. We know that that's the educational system we're still dealing with. Um, and so for me, as I think about the work that I do and working with administrators, faculty, staff at Hispanic serving institutions is like, these are your students. Read this book. These are the students who are coming into your institutions that you need to figure out how to better support. Right, we need to better support these students, and they give you good, great examples in the in the book about ways we can better support them. Um, and so that's how I, I I'm thinking about connecting it it to my work. But at the same time, I just get so I think y'all can probably see my passion of like what our, our students shouldn't have to struggle. These spaces should be spaces of liberation. Educational spaces should be spaces of liberation. Um, and at what point will they be? And how are we gonna continue to work towards um, creating those spaces for our students? Because they're gonna be here regardless. We see that in the stories that you tell in the book um, that y'all elevate in the book that they're gonna make it. They're gonna make it. How are we gonna stop putting barriers in front of them so that they don't have to fight so hard um, to get here and to, and to be here and to survive here. So thank you all for the work beautiful piece of work and I am honored to be here today um, to discuss the book with y'all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gina Garcia. I really appreciate your comments. Uh, uh, now we turn it over to Professor Solorzano. Thank you, Gil. I'm gonna share my screen <clears throat> and uh, see where I'm gonna go here, here, here. Um, Gil, you and, you and Nancy asked me to like the rest of us to, to sort of reflect on how the book um, um, connects with our own research. But I, I, I think when I first started reading the book, you did something, you, you and Nancy did something that really um, was really important in that you told your staff testimonial uh, about how you uh, came to do this book and in, in major way through higher education through education and higher education, uh, K through 12 and higher education. So this, these are my reflections on, on, on the book, but I actually gonna, I'm actually gonna begin um, by talking about my own sort of story because you, you inspired me to tell my story. And, and, and again, this is the, the Solorzano Sanchez immigration story. And, and it's, a, it's a really quick story, but it's, it starts with my paternal immigration story. My father's, my father's uh, family's immigration story from the state of Jalisco. In about the 1890s is when the, the data that I had the most, the, the data that I've gotten for, you know, to, to be able to collect. But they, they moved from, from, from the state of Jalisco to, to the city of Juarez. And my, my family, both my grandmother and my grandfather were bakers. They were Mexican bakers. Uh, and they made their way to Juarez. And then they made their way over the, 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 the river and the, in, in the bridge to El Paso. And that's where they started their family. My, my aunts and my uncles were born there. Uh, and uh, that's where they worked in the first bakery in the United States. Uh, they, 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 they worked in a bakery in El Paso. They moved across um, from El Paso to Bisbee, Arizona. My grandfather worked in a, in a mine there. Uh, my grandmother worked in a bakery there in Bisbee, Arizona, a Mexican bakery. They made their way to San Diego, California, and they, 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 they lived in what we now know as Vario Logan, uh, Logan Heights. And again, they worked in a bakery there. And that's where my father was born. My father was born in San Diego. They moved north to Los Angeles. Um, and again, once again, they, 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 they worked in a bakery in Lincoln Heights, uh, and then a second bakery in East Los Angeles in, in the area called Boyle Heights. But that, that's their family. And it's it, my family's sort of uh, immigration story, the, the movement, but it was, it was a movement of, of it, it centered around work and the work that they were doing and the work that they were doing and continued to do until the, my, my grandfather and my grandmother's passing uh, was, they were bakers. They, they worked in Mexican bakeries. My, my 
my mother's, my, my maternal story goes back a little further because my, my maternal family is from New Mexico. And we have, we've, we've dated at least for, for now to about the 1700s, 1760s, where we, we've documented where, where my, my uh, ancestors were born, where they worked, where they lived, uh, where they moved to. But my, my mother was born in Albuquerque and they moved and her family moved uh, to South Central Los Angeles uh, in, in LA. Um, and, and the movement there, it was, my, my grandfather was a railroad worker. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's his sort of story that I'll tell in a second, but, but, but here, here's the story. I'm, I'm going to go back to my grand, my paternal, uh, uh side for a second. And here's the, here's their, 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 their trajectory from Jalisco to Juarez to El Paso to Bisbee to San Diego to Los Angeles. This was their story. And it, again, it was all about the bakery business, all about, uh, uh, you know, moving as a result of work, um, they were, they were Mexican bakers. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this truck in, in a bit, but it's in this truck, and maybe not quite this one, uh, but it's in this truck where I would, I, would, I would drive with my father as he delivered bread throughout Los Angeles, throughout East Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, Chinatown, a little Tokyo. And we would deliver bread to the different sort of stores, the mom and pop stores in Southern California. And he would tell me stories about the communities that we're going into. And my father probably was, he, he, I began to understand community cultural wealth through the stories my father told me about these different communities we traveled through selling Mexican bread. Um, on my grandmother, my, my mother's side, my, my grandfather worked at the, at the, at the um, Atchison Topeka Santa Fe rail yard in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This is where he worked. They lived about two blocks from this factory in a barrio there uh, in, 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 in Albuquerque. And, and he eventually moved to LA and he worked at the Southern Pacific uh, Rail Yard, the Taylor Rail Yard in Northeast Los Angeles. And again, he was a railroad worker. My uncles were railroad workers. They came to LA to work the railroad. In this case, they were mechanics on the railroad. Uh, again, these stories I think are really, really important. And thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Gil, uh, for remind, reminding me that I, I, I need to continue to tell my story. And I think others, should tell their stories about how they came to be where they're where they're at, but in these stories, you know, as we're growing up, we we hear about the persistence of deficit frameworks over time. We hear about the reasons why, you know, me Mexicanos or Chicanos uh, don't do well in school, or aren't able to move up within organizations, uh, and it's always focused on deficits that they that they have these deficits, whether they're cultural deficiencies that exist within the home within the community or within the actual um, racial ethnic group itself, whether it's genetic deficiencies, that it's in our genes that were deficient, or it's in our social structural deficiencies, the way our households are structured, the way our communities are structured, et cetera. But these deficiency models have and continue to be um, paramount in how we explain um, some of the data that you share. Uh, it, it, I believe it's the first chapter or the second chapter about how, how poorly uh, uh, Mexicanos, Mexicans, Chicanos do in schools uh, and, and, and onward in, 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 into life. Um, but what I did is I, 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 I challenge those deficit frames by using something that we call community cultural wealth. And this sort of model uh, really was developed by my student, Terry Yasso, but really it begins before Terry. It begins with some of the work that I had done with, um, with uh, Dolores Delgado Bernal and Octavio Del Pando, where we started talking about challenging some of the deficit frames uh, using some of the, 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 the capitals, if you will, that, 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 uh, that emerge from this model. And so a community cultural wealth is an array of knowledge, skills, abilities, and networks possessed and utilized by communities of color to survive and resist racism and other forms of oppression. That's sort of a basic definition of what community cultural wealth is. And, and again, it has these different capitals. And these are the capitals that I begin to see in, in, in chapters three, four, five, and six of the book. The aspirational capital that exists within uh, Chicano and Chicano communities. The familial capital that, that they often talked about in, in some of the testimonials that they were sharing in those chapters. The linguistic capital uh, that, that exists within, within our communities and certainly within these students. 
the navigational capital that exists, how they're able to maneuver and navigate through, through life, whether it's the community college or the Ford Institution or just their neighborhoods and the greater area outside of their neighborhoods, the social capital or the social networks that exist within uh, their communities, um, within their families um, and within the different spaces they find themselves. And then finally, resistant capital, uh, this idea of how do we push back and, and looking at the history of how our communities have pushed back uh, uh, against uh, oppression uh, in, in the many forms that it takes within our communities. And so along this pathway, I mean, the one thing we know about the literature and, and, and is, that, is that in high school, the vast majority of our students, you know, 80, 90% of our students have high, really high aspirations for, for, for college, for college completion. Um, so that's where we start. But there's all these sort of stops along the way uh, to the AA degree or the, the certificate or the transfer that to, to a four-year institution. There are stopouts or pushouts along the way. There, when you finally get to the bachelor's degree, uh, uh, and, and there's a stopout as you move forward to the graduate professional degrees, and then finally uh, to the future, our future career. Uh, this, 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 it's not a linear path, is what you were explaining to us in chapters uh, three, four, five, and six. And I think the literature and, and the data sort of, sort of bear that out, that it's a very, it's a very, um, the pathway is, 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 it's difficult and it goes in many different directions. But I think that for me, the community cultural wealth, as I was reading each of those chapters, I was identifying the different forms of capital that existed within their testimonials, the aspirational, the familial, the linguistic, the navigational, the social and the resistant capitals that existed in their stories that they were telling. And also, as others have said, the, 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 the brilliance in which he used the Ansaldúan framing of Atravesados, uh, De Panteras and La Facultad, I mean, these were really powerful tools that you utilized in trying to uh, tell, help tell those stories of these uh, young men and women as they made their way through this pipeline. And so um, I, I'm gonna end by saying that it, 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 if we are the dreams, the hopes and aspirations of our ancestors, like my, my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents, then I would argue then what are our dreams, our hopes and aspirations for future generations? And I think that the Chicana, Chicano and Chicanx dream, hope, resistance and educational success, success helps us answer that question. And I think it does it in a brilliant way using the stories of, of these young men and women. And so I wanna congratulate you, Nancy and Bill, for an amazing, Gil, for an amazing piece of uh, scholarship. And just to, 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 to say that uh, this is really an important contribution um, uh, for, to, to, for the literature. And I think uh, every one of us who teaches classes um, of this sort have to use it in our classrooms and have to begin, begin sharing it out in different spaces that we find ourselves in. And I would argue not just in, in schooling spaces, I think activist spaces have to be reading this book as well. So I wanna thank you for, 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 for allowing me to share my work with you all. Thank you, Danny, really appreciate your words. And I'd like a, a shout out to Danny on his new book on racial microaggressions. Uh, looking forward to buying it and perhaps maybe Danny you can host a, a seminar so we can all listen to your, your words and your co-authors words. Um, thank you, Danny. Uh, now it's uh, uh, Nancy Acevedo, my fearless uh, co-author, uh, uh, who will who will do some concluding remarks before we open it up for uh, a question and answer. All right. Thank you all so much for taking time and energy uh, to be present with us today. I really, really appreciate you all being here and everyone listening as well. Um, I'm going to share my screen really briefly, and I know we only have about 15 minutes or so, and I want to also be considerate of everyone's time. So I'm going to go a little bit faster than maybe would be expected, but I just want to highlight a couple points. Um, as everyone has talked about a little bit around what are we envisioning, right? What do we want for the future? What do we hope our institutions will look like? What kind of work is needed so that our Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx students can navigate these spaces um, so that they are less toxic, um, so that these colonial roots are less, um, you know, strong or less negative and have a negative, a less, less smaller negative impact for our students. 
Uh, part of what we propose in the concluding chapter is this notion around the bandlera uh, consciousness um, to foster the, the Chicana, Chicano, Chicana extreme. And we're arguing that it's a two-pronged approach that really focuses on Nepantlera praxis for educators and educational leaders um, so that you know the institutions do the work. And then there's also this second approach of having developing a sense of belonging for Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx students. And what does that entail? Um, we argue that together, these two approaches will help to decenter these heteronormative white standards and institutional racism that's present throughout higher ed systems in the US. Um, and part of what we call for is, let me move my, there we go, is the need to, what does Nepantlera praxis entail, right? So we argue that it's this need to dismantle stereotypes. A lot of times we are coming into education with these very stereotypical views based on a little bit of um, what Leo Chavez shared right now around what's the framing of Latino, Latino, Chicano, Chicano, Chicanx students. Um, this need to then not just dismantle the stereotypes, but be reflexive, right? And, and Saldua are calls for creative acts in this reflexivity. So writing, um, uh, painting, whatever it entails for us to be able to reflect on how have we um, maybe reproduced or been complicit in these stereotypes around Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx students and how do we then need to, what changes do we need to make? Um, and then moving forward to making the common every day seem strange and problematic, right? So where the common understanding, well, HSIs don't have enough resources. Well, we just don't have that money, right? Well, that's a problem and it shouldn't be the accepted. Uh, we are in a nation that you know, has so much wealth. That should not be the case, that that's not acceptable. Um, and then really thinking about what does it entail to examine critically the culture, the organization, and these structures of privileges within our higher education institutions. Um, how do we challenge these, these marginalizing structures? Um, but then working with our educational leaders and our educators, our faculty, our counselors, our staff to and think about what does it mean to re-envision a socially just reality? What would it look like at a community college to re-envision what, what a community college experience for students should look like? Um, and how do we then avoid replicating marginalizing structures? And I think the the uh, Chancellor Oakley in, in the California Community College system is, is an example of going through this process, right? I think the system is by far, far from perfect. And of course the process has been somewhat problematic based on who you ask, but it's this approach, this attempt to avoid replicating these marginalizing structures, to re-envision what does it mean to get rid of developmental education and assessments um, so that students are supported better. Um, so I think this, this is, definitely possible. It's just a matter of doing the work and doing the work as a community and, and together, right? Um, because we can't do it individually. Um, and so let me go back to this. Now, what is it? what would it mean to develop a sense of belonging? Part of what we argue is that Nepantla is a sense of belonging. You know, when we think about sense of belonging for, for Chicana, Chicana, Chicana students, oftentimes what, what, what we have currently at institutions is they have to do the work. Right. If you feel like you belong at a UC Berkeley, it's because you're part of the, the bridges and you're part of uh, the recruitment and retention centers and you're, you're the one doing the work for the institution. Is that what it means for our Chicano students to belong in education? That's not what it should entail, right? It should be this, this home, this community for them as well. So we know that it takes uh, guidance counselors and advisors to be on board, teachers in the K-12 level and faculty and staff um, we know that it takes challenging these academic and curricular experiences moving away from what's traditionally expected and, and what's this white normative expectations, right? We know that we need to distribute our institutional resources in an equitable manner. I mean, how can we get away from that? Um, if, if we don't wanna distribute our resources differently, then we're not going to be able to foster uh, the success for more students, right? Um, we know we need to restructure hiring practices. What does it mean when faculty are hiring the same people in the same mindset? What does it mean when we are hiring without taking into account who our current students are? And it doesn't mean um, only hiring Latino, Latino, Chicano, Chicano, Chicanx faculty, but it does mean hiring faculty who are critically conscious. What does it mean to center critical consciousness? Um, as in, within our hiring practices and to hire people who know how to work with low-income, first-generation Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx students. Um, 
and then also thinking about what does it mean to foster this familial peer relationships that Latinos, the Chicana, Chicano, Chicano students seem to foster on their own. They're doing the work to, to make each other feel like this is, you know, institutions are home to them. But what would it look like for a faculty member to do that in their classroom? What would it look like for our programs um, to do that in, in these different settings for the tutoring center to work differently for students? Um, and then also re-envisioning community engagement, not just as you go out and do the work and, and you know, civ be civically engaged college students in the traditional sense, but La Chicana, Chicana, Chicana students are doing this work. They need to be getting paid for it, right? We need to hire our students to do the work that they're redoing for the institution. They're recruiting and they're retaining students for the institution. We need to um, not just pay them what they should be paid, but also prepare them and equip them so that they can continue on to graduate school and to pursue their, their career pathways. Um, what would it mean for students to have these research internships early on uh, and to be able to connect research with the work that they want to do this social just through the social justice lens. Um, and I want us to conclude because I want us to have a couple minutes at least for, for Q&A uh, with a quote from Gloria Saldua. And traditionally we may see that last sentence where she says nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in the images in our heads. But I think what's really important is what precedes that, right? She says, I change myself, I change the world. Awareness of our situation must come before interchanges, which in turn come before changes in society. Then nothing happens in the world unless it happens in the images in our head, right? So just this process around this need to self-reflect on what's happening around us, our society, our context, um, and then making changes with our own actions, whether it be as students, whether it be as faculty, as counselors, as administrators, um, and then we can create inst institutional changes, right? So just, I wanna thank you all for, for your time and I'm gonna hand it back to, to Gil. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much. Thank you for the panel. Uh, I'd like to open it up for questions, um, maybe among those out there or even among panelists. I do have a question. Maybe I can start if that's okay. Uh, uh, I think Nancy remembers as we were writing this book, I was struggling uh, and hearing Leo Chavez in my head. <laughs> you know, we were having a, a tacos outside of the, uh, uh, I think it was Eureka. And I was telling Leo how we were, I was conceptualizing the book and I was telling the story. And then he says to me, Gil, won't that reify the Latino threat having educated Chicanos, right? So then maybe, maybe Leo, if you can tell us a little bit about that, because it's still, you know, we, we talked about the Latino threat, but are we still a, a, the threat when we become educated? I think we are, because, I mean, just think about what needs to be done right now. I mean, look at you, look at uh, Nancy, and, and look at all the other faculty members here and, and professors talking. I mean, if, if you really want to have America, think of America great again, that's an America before we existed. That we before we were part of this university, it's a it's a it's an America from 1960s when 90 percent of people were white, and and Latinos were five percent. Mexican origin people were five percent of the population. So I think I think basically, some people really fear the educated Latino, they, as just as much as they fear the educated African American or the educated Asian. I think it's just basically the idea that you know once you get education, you you much less likely to take for granted that the place people are putting into you, you into is a place you should be. And you work very hard to break down those barriers for everybody else. And I think, you know, I think for most people, that's not a fear, but I think for some people, uh, and I won't mention any names from that, it, that is sort of a, a fear, I think, that when they see a lot of educated people like us talking about the kind of research you're doing, you're breaking barriers. And, um, you know, barriers are there for a reason because they protect those on the other side of that barrier. So in a sense, if you're breaking that barrier, you are a threat. So I think uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't continue becoming uh, educated and, and forcing changes in society. And that's what's gonna cause uh, the images in our mind, as Gloria says, to change. Uh, other panelists, any, any thoughts about that? You know, I, I'm not, I, I won't speak to that, but I'll speak to something that I was talking about uh, in terms of community cultural wealth. And I, I may get this wrong, Laura, but uh, I remember hearing you speak 
uh, it might have been Ahi, it might have been Ash, uh, but I heard you speak, and I remember you talking about your mom, and I remember you talking about your mom having this 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 school um, mm -hmm. in your home, mm -hmm. and I, I those are the kind of stories that I think um, that they're out there all over our community, right? That 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 we don't often recognize, we don't often honor, but it's I think I mean I, I know I'm I'm, I'm 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 hoping that your mom is still alive, but if she if she's not. I mean, if, if, if we had documented her story, I, I think stories like that would have been really, really important in helping continue that story that you all tell in chapters four, uh, three, four, five, and six. I mean, it would be, it would be those testimonials about how our community, the people in our community, our parents, um, uh, activists who, who've been doing this work. I, I just picked up this book. Um, it's called Reading, Writing, and Revolution. Escuelitas and the emergence of a Mexican American identity in Texas that I think speaks to those small schools um, that were that, that she's speaking to the Texas experience, but I think we could probably find those schools all over uh, the United States um, in, in, in how they serve not just Chicana, Chicano, and Chicanx communities, but other communities of color as well. Yeah, the, the author of that book actually interviewed me uh, for, I was one of the people that she interviewed me for, for the book, but uh, my mom passed away in 2010 at, at almost 100 years old, about two and a half months shy of one, her 100th birthday. But she had one of these escuelitas for 50 cents a week per child. She taught reading and writing and mathematics uh, in Spanish. So she was my first teacher. Uh, so yeah, there's extraordinary stories. I was touched with your story too, Danny. I, I had no idea about you know your background. It's, it's just extraordinary, and I think all of us have a story to share here. And typically, we don't share those stories. And and so you know, part of what what we have to learn is that the past is always with us, and part of being here is healing the past and thinking about those that are coming behind us. Thank you. It's five o'clock, uh, but maybe there's one question we as a panel could take on. And I thought maybe this is a good question for Gina Garcia. Uh, Fernando Villalpondo asks, how do young Chicana or ex faculty and or higher ed administrators challenge the current structures, especially when they are trying to establish themselves and meet the demands of tenure track positions or their roles as administrators? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. You want me to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I will give my, a quick answer. Um, so whenever I give, I actually gave a talk today with the um, Haku Dean's forum and I get a similar question all the time is like, how do we um, change the structures of higher ed to, to get to that, that space of liberation that you, you speak about and dream about, Gina, like how do we actually get there? And I have to often remind us that um, we are the movement. A lot of times um, it's not the high level administrators. It's not the, the board of trustees. Like they're not the ones that are gonna make the change for us. They're often the ones that are reinforcing the dominant narrative. Um, and we are the ones that are often um, the, the ones fighting on the ground, the ones that are, are part of the social movement. And the social movement doesn't get everybody in on it. Right. Not everybody wants to be part of the movement, um, but we have to fight anyways. And the movement will eventually lead to change. So I think that's um, how I like to think about it, that just small acts of resistance that we we do, um, even teaching a book like this book at my very white institution is an act of resistance. Right. Sharing this with my predominantly white student population is an act of resistance. And so I think that that's how we have to do it. Right. Small acts of resistance will lead to, to long term change. Great, uh, thank you so much. I, I, we're over, it's 5.02, and I'd like to give Nancy Acevedo the final word before we close the session. Uh, thank you all very much. Nancy, conclude. Okay, <laughs> thank you all so much for being here. And you know, Danny, I appreciate you bringing in Community Culture Wealth because when we started this book, and somebody, Marcela was just answering her, her question. When we started this book, it was centering around Latina, Latino, Latinx student identities. And it was bringing in community cultural wealth as a, as a core element. I think we might have like a, a visual framework at one of the beginning stages where we use community cultural wealth, but then it became to be, it, then, then the reviewers were talking about volumes and different, you know, different levels of a book and, and it became to be too much. 
Um, and we actually had great feedback from our reviewers and our editors to, to highlight and to remind us that the students we were focusing on, who we had interviewed, were uh, Chicana, Chicano, Chicanic students. And so that's where we shifted the, the title to honor that the that student population who we who we had interviewed um so i know that this work wouldn't have been possible without all it just this immense community of of individuals who have supported us throughout this process and gil thank you for for getting sending me that random text and i don't even remember when it was and he was like let's write a book <laughs> so um it's been a beautiful journey and i'm so fortunate to be part of it and i'm hoping that this book will contribute to the literature, which we have so many different resources. But I think what you know, you've highlighted, if we are not assigning them in the classrooms, if we are not assigning them to our principals, to our um, teachers, it, as a principal to teachers, as an administrator to your administration team, then it's going to be pointless, right? So people have to actually read. And I made a joke at the very beginning, we don't have an audio book for this, right? But people have to do the reading and have to do the work. Um, so it's one thing to say you want and that you aspire for your students to, to do better. But it's another thing for you to have those expectations for yourself to do better as an educator, um, to be able to support this Chicana, Chicano, Chicana extreme, which is, is very present and visible in, throughout our communities. Um, so thank you all so much for for your time and for your for for your you know energy of, of being here appreciate you all thank you very much uh have a great day and i believe there's a 40 percent discount for anyone that wants to purchase the book uh thank you for our esteemed uh panelists thank you for those in the audience uh, uh again thank you for joining us gracias thank you thank you, thank you everyone thank you. thank you that was great all right Gracias. Bye.